Hi, I'm Caitlin Thorne, a senior editor with Over the Horizons. Here with me today is Lieutenant Colonel Andy Anderson, a former flight test engineer for the X-51 program. Colonel Anderson, thank you for being Thanks, with us. Thanks, it's great to be here. Sir, can you start out with a basic definition of what hypersonics is and why it's so difficult to travel at hypersonic speeds versus mm. supersonic speeds? Yeah, well, I think um, I'm not a physicist, first of all, so I can't speak to a lot of the intricate details of what hypersonics is. It's uh, a region of flight where you're traveling so fast that little, literally the air molecules are disassociating and turning into plasma. Um, what that creates um, is a couple of difficulties. First, um, there's a lot of drag um, uh, acting on whatever it is you're flying through the atmosphere. Uh, the, the heat is incredible. Uh, so uh, as your um, structure is traveling that fast, it's also at risk of completely melting because the heat is so hot. And thirdly, and perhaps the most challenging, is that in order to sustain that, you need in, in, in um, uh, our, our efforts in recent hypersonic uh, study have been on how to do that in an air-breathing way. So in, an, in, in, in essence, this is something that actually takes in oxygen um, and then uses that as a means of propulsion instead of just a rocket, because we know how to do that for a long time. Okay, sir. Um, can you comment on some of the potential future military applications for hypersonics? Yeah, I think what hypersonics gives you, and specifically I'm talking about not just rockets, but hypersonic vehicles that actually are propulsed through the air um, in, in either a boost glide fashion or um, and a fuel burning, oxygen, uh, oxygen burning way. Um, hypersonics gives you the ability to um, not only move fast, but to some ends. So um, you're able to maneuver and add some, um, some stealth technology in that um, to be able to give your ad adversary a more challenging um, weapon to counter than just simply a rocket. Um, because a rocket, it's, um, t it's uh, Trajectory is predictable, mm -hmm. so we can target it. Uh, hypersonics technologies gives you a, the ability to fly fast, but also maneuver um, and add some stealth capability so that it would give you maybe persistence um, over a target environment or the ability to loiter and, uh, um, and penetrate uh, um, anti-access capabilities. Um, you're basically getting everything you would want to do over an enemy's airspace without them being able to catch you. Hmm. Interesting. Um, there's been some recent concern about China's recent gains in mm -hmm. hypersonic technologies. Can you comment on the potential implications for that for uh, future uh, U.S. national security? Yeah, well, so what I know about China's uh, claimed advances is that they've claimed they've been able to test successfully hyper te hypersonic technologies. Um, but what I'll say, just from my experience with technology and innovation and strategy, is that a single technology does not make a strategy. Um, it is uh, incredibly hard to not only perfect hypersonic technologies, but turn them into uh, um, weapons that meet sustainability, reliability um, parameters, and then uh, tie that to other capabilities um, in a way that gives you a strategic advantage. I think one thing we need to be concerned about is um, how, what is our overall capacity to innovate, not just mm -hmm. in hypersonics, but um, uh, and a broad uh, array of um, military applications across um, uh, future innovation. How invested are we in really taking advantage of any new scientific breakthroughs that come and then turning those into military um, applications as quickly as possible? Where do you see hypersonics fitting in in that broad array of future technologies? How important or significant will that realm be? Um, I think it'll be incredibly significant. We've seen with China's uh, anti-access strategies and, and other areas of the world that are trying to den deny us access that in order to um, exert the kind of military leverage we've been able to do so over the last 20 or 30 years, 
we're really going to need to be constantly one step ahead of the enemy. Mm -hmm. um, and hypersonics is, is one way of doing that. Okay. Um, and I think we need to be concerned about not just hypersonics, but what are some alternative ways of, of creating the same effect. So are we, can we fuse different technologies that aren't hypersonics to give us something that could achieve the same effect? Sure. Um, also, there's been re some recent news about the development of the SR-72, mm -hmm. uh, which is a hypersonic vehicle with projected speeds of up to Mach 6. Mm -hmm. um, can you comment on what role this vehicle would perhaps play in the future operating environment? Sure. I think uh, just from my limited experience, I could see that uh, the SR-72 giving us um, potentially some advantage in, uh, in persistent ISR. Um, or strike capability, but again, uh, you know, you have to look at how that specific technology would fit into our portfolio. Um, I think the danger is trying to pursue something that we m think we need to go higher mm -hmm. and faster without necessarily understanding what it, what it is we're trying to do, and then look at um, um, the um, DOD um, acquisition framework calls it an, an analysis of alternatives looking across all our broad range of um, capabilities and seeing what we can do to tie things together, um, tie, fuse different capabilities to get that same effect. Um, one thing I would like to add on, on what, um, where our biggest challenges are is not necessarily pursuing um, the physics behind it, but also, which is tough, but also the testing. Uh, I, I uh, found that when I was a flight test engineer, our capacity as a, as a nation to test hypersonic technologies was extremely limited. Um, and that was evident in the C test ranges that we used for the X-51. Often, if we, uh, if we scrubbed a test or if we had a failed test, our next test date was about six months mm -hmm. out, maybe even a year. And we can't innovate like that. Mm -hmm. So that brings another interesting question. Um, the U.S. is to me, fairly good at innovating. However, our processes and procedures to get new and game-changing ch technologies out to the warfighter um, are very, should I say, bureaucratic and slow. How do you think those processes will affect uh, gains mm -hmm. in you know, getting hypersonic technology to the warfighter in a timely manner? I think that's definitely something we need to be concerned about because I do think that uh, other countries will have the capacity to innovate a lot faster than the U.S. will. And that's, I think, our biggest challenge and what we should be most afraid of when we hear reports about China testing uh, hypersonic vehicles is what is their capacity to innovate vis-a-vis -vis our capacity to innovate. Um, I think. One thing we need to be concerned about is how we transition technologies. How mm -hmm. do we take technologies that are making that breakthrough in science, um, like we showed the X-51 can do, but then the key, the critical link in that is turning that into a military capability. Um, and that's where we ended up with the X-51 program. It showed promise. Um, we achieved our goals. We proved some of the difficulties um, in, in uh, creating air-breathing hypersonic uh, technology, yet uh, there was no plan to easily transition that into something that could be sustainable, reliable, maintainable, and could really um, fit within a concept, broader concept of operations um, for some strategic end. Sir, you've identified that traveling at hypersonic speeds is very difficult. Um, just in your estimation, what year, or if it's even feasible, uh, do you predict having speeds to go hmm. hypersonic, <coughs> you know, keep, uh, Yeah, speeds? so um, brings up an interesting point uh, that when, when I was a staff member on the um, uh, scientific advisory board discussing hypersonic vehicles, the joke, the running joke was that hypersonics was the, is the technology of the future and always will be. Um, it, and there's, there's a lot of truth behind that. It is, it is a very difficult to um, in a, in a the, just the combustion chamber, the propulsion of hypersonics, um, being able to mix fuel and air at the right pressure and temperature um, in order to create this magic scenario where the, um, the uh, um, a uh, sustainable um, combustion cycle. That was just one example of the kinds of technologies that it was almost, um, 
the way you could see it as like a string of pearls technologies that everything had to work in um, a very specific, very controlled way in order to make this possible. And that's what we found was so challenging with the X51 program. Uh, I will say that I can't give you a, a time frame, but I, always, I do say that it's, it's going to be a challenge that's always, um, always going to be looking to, to new innovations to help um, turn that string of pearls into something that's militarily reliable. Okay, great. Well, sir, I want to thank you for your time today. Um, I want to thank you for your valuable insights regarding mm -hmm. hypersonics, and thank you for being here with us at Over the Horizon. Thank you.